Revolution Radio proudly presents live from Phoenix, Arizona, the Truth Deny Talk Radio with host Roxy Lopez. Join us here for topics you won't hear about on mainstream news, such as chemtrails, GMOs, nutrition, and conspiracy facts regarding your personal sovereignty. Humanity is 7 billion strong. We are the majority. And now, live from the Valley of the Sun, your host, Roxy Lopez. And a very good evening to everybody. Uh, This is our first debut for Friday nights. Uh, We've added Friday nights to the list of shows that we do. Uh, So thanks for joining us here. And um, I have a you know, very interesting uh, guest on this evening from Australia, and I'm going to bring him on shortly. Um, of course, uh, many of you know from the event pages on Facebook that we now do for the shows um, who our guest is and what the, the topic is, of course, is uh, chemtrails and chemtrail activism. Um, I, I'm, I'm looking at a an article that's really disturbing to me right now. It's called uh, uh, Get Used to break, uh, record-breaking heat bureau, uh, it is uh, come out of the Age of Environment tabloid. Uh, that's where the story hailed from in January, I believe. And we're going to have a few articles this weekend that are going to be coming up on the Truth Denied website as well. Just go to the breaking news pages, and of course, um, we'll be interlinked with uh, Paul Mack, who is my guest this evening. And if anyone wants to take a look at any of his uh, website and his work, um, it's all linked on the truthdenied.com. And of course, it'll be in the chat room. I want to thank uh, a mad painter uh, for producing my shows on Fridays now. I appreciate it. And of course, if you want to listen to uh, a mad painter's shows, it's called Open Canvas. And they're on Monday nights here on Revolution radio at 10 p.m. Eastern. Again, that's Open Canvas, Mondays at 10 p.m., and he's got some extraordinary controversial shows as well, so you might want to take a listen to him as well. Uh, The the, uh, article that I'm looking at that um, I find disturbing, let me read a few of the highlights of it for you all. Um, There's a photo of a beach in Australia with a lot of people on the beach, and it says, Life's a Beach. As the warming trend increases over coming years, record-breaking heat will become more and more common, scientists say. Temperatures off the charts as Australia turns deep purple and U.S. US posts year of record high temperatures as well. The heat wave has that has scorched the nation since Christmas is a taste of things to come, with this week's records set to tumble again and again in the coming years, climate scientists are saying. Uh, Quote, those of us who spend our days trawling and contributing to the scientific literature on climate change are becoming increasingly gloomy about the future of human civilization. That's a strong statement. The hottest average maximum temperature ever recorded across Australia, 40.33 degrees, uh, that's uh, not Fahrenheit, I believe, set on Monday, again, this was written in January of 2013, may only stand for 24 hours and be eclipsed when all of Tuesday's readings come in. Previously, that record had stood since December 21st of 1972. The current heat wave, in terms of its durations, Its intensity and its extent is now unprecedented in records, said the Bureau of Meteorology's Manager of Climate Monitoring and Prediction, David Jones. He said clearly the climate system is responding to the background warming trend. Everything that happens in the climate system now is taking place on a planet, which is a degree hotter than it used to be. Now, a degree may not sound like a lot to all of you, but it is. As the warming trend increases over coming years, record-breaking heat will become more and more common, Dr. Jones said. We know that global climate doesn't respond monotonically. It does go up and down with natural variation. That's why some years are hotter than others because of a range of factors. But we're getting many more hot records than we're getting cold records. That's not an issue that is explained away by natural variation. Australia's climate is based on an interplay of many factors, including regional and local weather patterns.
patterns, El Nino and La Nina climate cycles, and the Indian Ocean dip hole, all superimposed on the greenhouse gas-driven warming trend. While temperatures vary on a local and regional scale, globally it has now been 27 years since the world experienced a month that was colder than average. The impacts of the rising heat on farming, food, water, and human health have been studied closely for years, and the trends being played out now mirror those laid out years ago in projections by the Bureau of Meteorology, the CICERO, and the Garnet Climate Change Review. Now, if there is one thing that I will interject here, we are seeing a lot of... uh, controversy when it comes to the weather, extreme weather, uh, temperatures that are too low, temperatures that are too high, mostly temperatures that are going up and down sporadically, which I term is as unstable weather. The global climate is unstable. And what does that mean to all of us humans or anybody that's living on the planet? Instability has to be pointing at something. Now, I don't follow the global warming hoax that is linked to cap and trade and all the rest of it and quite a few of the laws that have aggravated me in regards to climate change. Uh, By the way, climate change is now the new terminology for global warming. Um, This is a major concern and then you enter into this field, uh, radiation management, let's say, all the geoengineering and of course those grids in the sky that we refer to so fondly of as chemtrails. What are chemtrails? Has anybody tested chemtrails? What are the effects of chemtrails? What are the effects of geoengineering on the planet? And who gave them permission? That's what I want to know. I'm sure that's what people like my guest who will be coming on the show shortly wants to know. I want to know who is in charge and who gave them permission because we, the people of all of these countries, all the countries of the world, we are supposed to be in charge. We are the governing agents of our countries. We weren't given the memo. This is an extraordinary subject, one that I've been investigating for nearly four years, Uh, and the rabbit hole is deep. That's all I can say. The rabbit hole is absolutely astounding. And those who've been hired as disinformationists and so forth by the governments of the world to be in the center of activism groups and cause disharmony and slow down momentum with infighting, etc., it is... It's such a huge topic. Tonight's topic is chemtrail activism growing, the protest movements, networking internationally, and of course, the April 20th protest. A 46-year-old New Zealander living in Melbourne, Australia. My guest, Mr. Paul Mack, has a background in construction and currently works as a project manager for a large construction company. He says he was awakened in 2001 to the global situation regarding Agenda 21 and the New World Order. And he spent uh, the last few years seeing just how deep the rabbit hole goes. Twelve months ago, he became increasingly concerned about growing geoengineering trends and the lack of activism taking place to bring accountability to the situation. He strongly believes that unless action is taken now to bring a ban moratorium into place to halt geoengineering and stratospheric aerosol spraying, a.k.a. chemtrails, that the planet and life as we know it is in great danger from an extinction level event. The madness of a handful of evil men and women must be stopped. And it is up to you and I to call these people to account. In partnership with some fellow Australians and New Zealanders, they have worked hard over the last 12 months to bring together a national, international network of like-minded people who are documenting and collating the growth but the growing body of evidence in regards to chemtrails as well as forming a growing international protest movement to bring awareness to the public arena. 
the Australian and New Zealand geoengineering protests had their first mass rally in January 2013, where over 180 people from four nations took to the streets to protest geoengineering and demand government disclosure. We now run a quarterly, I'm sorry, he now runs a quarterly protest, the next dates being April 20th and July 20th, which we will get into tonight. We have uh, the links for the Facebook page and the email uh, available for you all on the truthdenied.com. It's all linked up right there on the front page. We want you to link up, like their pages, join them in this movement. I know it's hard to believe that people are, the majority of humans do not even know, are not even aware of geoengineering programs, this thing we call climate change, the money behind it, the billionaires that are funding it, completely unaware. So I'd like to welcome my guest, Mr. Paul Mack, and I thank you, Paul, for the work that you're doing to bring awareness to the world. Welcome to the show, and how are you doing? Hey, Roxy. <clears throat> Thank you for having me on the show. It's uh, it's good to be here and doing doing well this morning, uh, a little after ten o'clock in the morning down in uh, in Melbourne, Australia. Awesome. So, uh, yeah, now really good to be here. And uh, you know, just listening to your preamble, and and I've gone to that article that you were uh, reading from uh, in our local newspaper down here, The Age, and that beach. It's at the top of that article. It's like a thirty minute drive from where I am. Um, and the, the article itself is, is pretty much a, clearly a propaganda piece on, um, on climate change and, and what's going on. Um, th- those record-breaking temperatures that you were talking about, uh, I can verify, having just lived through them, that um, a lot of those days we had very clearly geoengineered skies and massive uh, harp activity happening to drive that temperature up, in fact. The day they broke the record, the very next day, the uh, the temperature dropped down some, you know, 15, 20 degrees, literally, and it rained. It was almost like they turned uh, turned the harp off and just let it sort of reset itself. So they they pushed that um, that boundary deliberately to to break that record and uh, use it as a tool to say, see, look, you know, climate change is real. You know, Australia is suffering big big bushfires and um, and high temperatures, and they're record breaking. Um, that was a very very deliberate thing that they did, and um, it was not pleasant to live through temperature-wise. I can tell you, um, you know, just a, did a quick Celsius to Fahrenheit conversion. The average temperature during that period, 40.33 Celsius, is 104.59 Fahrenheit, um, and we typically had days that were, you know, in the in the 42, 43 uh, bracket, which is you know 109 for you guys. So. Um, very, very hot temperatures, very, very difficult to, to live in those uh, sorts of temperatures for prolonged uh, basis. Not our normal cycle. We'd normally have, you know, three or four really hot days and we'll go through a very humid period with uh, massive thunderstorms and a, a few days of cool down and then, then repeat that. That's typical for Australian weather, not, uh, not 9, 10, 11, 12 days straight of, uh, you know, high 30 to 40 degree temps. So, um, it was interesting to hear you talk about that because you know it's uh, it's clearly um, <clears throat> an engineered piece to uh, to just promote the the further in climate change agenda and you know I mean climate change is real but it's it's man made in as much as we're causing it by geoengineering not uh, not anything that uh, the planet's doing to itself that's for sure. Agreed, um, and, and thank you for interjecting to that piece because um, it it's. The propaganda is on and, um, you know, it's quite interesting because uh, just to mention briefly here in the States, there was a Clean Energy Standard Act of 2012 that was uh, initiated in March of 2012. And, of course, one of the groups that was backing that legislation was Al Gore. Mm. And, uh, his, and his organization and it, it never made it through. Which I think uh, my point is, it is interesting that even the governments, I think, are have massive confusion around what they're even supposed to be doing um, as far as the – I think the left hand's not speaking to the right. And I I did look at a bill that 
actually was passed in uh, Australia. And I read through some of it. And it, it, these bills are absolutely convoluted. And I don't think that they're being put together for the sake of clean energy, free energy, as they are uh, summarizing. I think it has a lot more to do with cap and trade and money and more money. Uh, you know, it, it appears that they want to uh, reduce you know, greenhouse emissions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and even the use of oil. But it, it seems that that's never going to happen. And in our country, this Clean Energy Standard Act of 2012 never even passed. I mean, they can't even get it off the floor. <laughs> so You know what I mean? It's like yeah, it, it, yeah. it's coming down. It's it's coming down. And again, the left hand not speaking to the right. So you probably have a lot of people who are in government who don't even know what the heck is going on. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and that's proof. I mean, uh, for sure, these bills are two and three thousand pages long, and nobody reads them, and nobody signs them, or nobody wants to sign off on mm-hmm. them because they don't understand them. Regardless, how do you feel about um, the bill that uh, was the law? I should say that was passed in Australia, or are are you aware of it? Uh, yeah, a little bit. Look, I mean, <clears throat> a lot of those things, Roxy. I mean, these scientists. Um, Far from being, um, you know, the independent, authoritative body that uh, that they possibly could and, and should be, um, you know, they're beholden to the government for um, for their grant money to to do their research. And of course, the government can talk to them about their research and say, you know, we just want you to tweak that a little bit to uh, to suit our ends, and you know, we'll give you some more grant money to that. So basically, um, a lot of these guys, you know. They've got all the huff and puff and, and bluster and you should listen to us and, you know, we're, we're the kings of the information. But essentially, they're, they're just, you know, media and propaganda whores and they sell themselves for a high price. And uh, and then, um, you know, Tim, Tim Flannery is one of our guys down here. I mean, a few, few years ago, he, he received uh, the Order of Australia for his work in, in climate science and uh, predicting that our dams would be empty and, you know, um, houses would be flooding with, with ocean water by... 2012, which you know might add was last year, um, and then currently you know b- buys a beachside property in in Sydney in uh, New South Wales and and enjoys government largesse uh, at the moment. Uh, none of his predictions have come come true, you know, through. So um, pretty much a big feeling in our country that he should be stripped of his Order of Australia and uh, made to apologise to us all for for being a climate alarmist, you know. So we, we've got a lot of that down here. They they periodically pass uh, very things like. Uh, permanent uh, cloud seeding has now been authorised for the for the snowy mountains to for the snow making uh, fields, but all all of that of course runs off into um, into our rivers and things like that. So they they periodically pass these things, and it's more um, just to look like they're doing something yeah, right. rather than, than actually doing something. Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah, and I, I I agree with that as well. And I think um, you know that whole global warming that uh, you know Al Gore had done in the beginning. I think people bought it for a little bit, and then um, and, and then people aren't buying it. And it doesn't mean that <clears throat> citizens of the world uh, know what's going on necessarily, but they're at least not uh, taking the bait. And and that's something that that I I think is an in for you and I as activists. Um, when you, uh, let's say, uh, begin a conversation with somebody, you're trying to educate somebody, Paul, on what is happening uh, with climate change or geoengineering or the purposeful changing of the climate, where do you begin and uh, what is your most successful way of approaching somebody so that they don't think you're crazy and um, are more accepting of what you have to show them? (laughs) <laughs> that's a that's a good question because you you do get that uh, you know tilt of the head like you know you you on the same planet as I'm I'm one sort of look occasionally um, look Roxy I mean you, you tailor that to um, to whomever you're talking to basically uh, you know I'm always looking for the conversation I look for people who are who are looking up with their heads tilted already and and, and wondering um, and it's easy to engage people on on that level um, <clears throat> if there's an opportunity. Uh, you know, a news article that pops up, or, or you know, something of interest is generated in, in a conversation. Um, I might might pounce on that and just just throw out a feeler and and see where that person's sitting in, in terms of what they think of. You know, climate change is a very easy place to start. I mean, 
that can be a very sort of black and white conversation. There's there's people that are adamant that um, you know uh, man-made fossil fuel burning is is causing this problem. Um, but but I think most people are open to that as a conversation. It's a it's a good lead in. Um, geoengineering as a term and terminology is is something that we really probably should be using because it's what what the scientific community is now using and espousing and pushing forward. And there's there's a mountain of uh, material weight of evidence um, of these programs um, that that's that's out there in the marketplace. I mean I don't know how anyone can deny it. The, their own people, their own scientists are writing that, you know, that they're saying either A, they are going to do it or, or B, they are doing it or C, you know, hey, is it a good idea to do it because, you know, we might stuff the planet up more. So people are already talking about that. I think if you can get onto geoengineering as a topic, um, then you can you can uh, go down, you know, a myriad of different roads with that. Um, the, the word chemtrail is, you know, it's it's – got some really good good connotations it's got some really negative ones as it's been uh, utilized and generated throughout um, you know the last sort of five or six years let's say um, but it's a legitimate word and and you know not everyone's aware of it yet but as more and more people come become aware of it they uh, they they are linking it to that, that conspiracy side of things so I like to tie that straight back to a geoengineering perspective and, uh, and you know, and say, look, the stratospheric aerosol injection, you know, you want to see a government document, here it is. It's here in black and white. The government's writing about the fact that they're doing this or planning on doing this, um, where, of course, they're doing it covertly mostly right now. But if you can use that terminology um, to to your effect, then, um, then you know, it, it ties in with the whole thing. So... It's it's a difficult conversation to have with some people, um, you know. Ten percent of the people are just going to deny what you're saying, no matter what. Ten percent of the people are going to believe what you're saying, no matter what. It's the other eighty percent that's up to you and in, in the conversation that you have. Um, you know, you don't want to sort of go at it hammer and tongs all the time. It's there's you know room for uh, for for sitting back and just planting a few seeds and uh, and letting people look up themselves and notice. I think when people look up for the first time, they see their very first chemtrail and they, they recognise it for what it is, um, that penny drops and uh, conversations that you might have planted seeds in earlier um, will come back and bear fruit at that time. You know, I have a lot of people come back to me and say, you know what, I listened to what you said the other day and I, was, I looked into it and then, you know, I saw um, this plane go over and I couldn't believe it. You know, it, you're right, it's not a contrail, it's a chemtrail. Um, you know, what do I need to do now? How can I get more information? I'm really freaked out about this, um, uh, you know, because that, that first thought of um, your government actually poisoning you from the air is a terrifying thought. So, um, you know, you generate the, the back sort of conversation through through planting the seed up front, really. Oh, wow. And, uh, yeah, that sounds uh, reasonable, actually. And then, like you said, point out some of the facts of um, what the government is talking about or what science is talking about. Um, there are a couple of arguments, and, and um, one of them is, you know, a lot of these um, scientific uh, white papers are talking about – uh, the idea of possibly trying. And if you're just joining us, we are speaking with Paul Mack from Australia, and the uh, subject is uh, chemtrails. Um, and, and before we left for the break, uh, Paul, you know, I get a lot of questions myself, such as, um, for instance, David Keith seems to be the, the uh, spokesperson for all geoengineering science. Um, and Keith Caldera and a few others, but David Keith, it seems to be the mainstream for geoengineering. And when he talks about it in interviews, ABC did a fabulous interview with him. He really exposed the mission. I mean, he was talking about it in a past tense. And generally, they talk about it as though they're looking at, you know, computer models uh, before they dare go out and experiment because of the effects that it can possibly have, uh, what geoengineering technologies uh, can, you know, maybe screw it up or something. And um, can they effectively cool the planet? And what would the costs be? When really, they're already doing it. They've already implemented it. And, of course, the other question that we get all the time is, have you tested a contrail? So these are the most common of the questions, um, which 
which I think are ridiculous uh, because both are b- both are happening and both have been tested. But can you talk about that for a little bit? And why does wa- weather modification exist anyway? That would be another good one. Uh, why? Because they can. <laughs> you know, man, man is uh, he's not the sharpest of beasts some days. And, uh, you know, just because you can do something doesn't mean you should, probably should do it. Um, <clears throat> The, the terminology around geoengineering is is quite interesting because to anyone who's researched it for any length of time, you know, say just six months even, um, it's patently obvious that it's happening and it's happening on a global scale. Um, so on the one hand, you know, there's there's good anecdotal evidence and uh, and physical empirical evidence in terms of, you know, people have been doing soil and water tests and and um, <clears throat> hair and blood analysis, that sort of thing, and and they're finding exactly what we'd expect to find from the supposition that we're being sprayed is high levels of the chemicals, aluminium, barium, strontium, uh, sulfur dioxides, um, you know, even uranium in some cases. So, um, to to say that it's in a planning stage and it's it's in a stage where um, you know, this is something that's mooted to be coming as a, as a way to save the planet from from the evils of climate change. Um, is you know, it's an out and out lie, basically. Um, what they're doing with that, I believe, is is just um, pre-positioning themselves for a greater release of information at some point. It, I I think the the cat's sort of right on the edge of just tipping out of the bag with with what's going on with geoengineering. Um, and the whole chemtrail phenomenon. So there, there'll, there'll be an event that is a tipping point. Um, I'm not sure what that will be. It, it will be quite a significant thing. And then they'll they'll confess. They'll say, you know what, um, we've been doing this for a little while now. We, we didn't really want to tell you because we didn't want to panic you about this this situation. Um, but you know, it's okay. We've got we've got it in hand, and uh, and uh, you know, we, we, we're the masters of it because we've been doing it for a while. So. I think that's that's what will happen in the future um, for the, the, the subject matter, the content to, to come forward and, and be further legitimised by the guys who are perpetrating it. Um, at the same time, you know, for these chills to sit out there and, and say chemtrails aren't real and, and, and keep banging on chemtrail contrail science, um, it, <laughs> they're just, you know, the... The horse is bolted, you know. You're shutting the door behind uh, behind the fact, you know. We're we're all aware that you're you're there in a prepaid position to 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 put disinformation out there. But hey, why don't you bring your your topic and your conversation over to where you know the real people are playing, which is geoengineering, and uh, and the weight of evidence that's uh, it sits there. I mean, there's, there are thousands and thousands of documents. Um, um, that, that have been produced by the scientific community and publications, and uh, um, you know you can go to, to many of them and, and just look at the, the you know the, the, the content and, and, the, and the weight of topic that goes through that on, on the whole thing. So, you know, I don't understand why they're continuing to uh, to, to you know try and hide something that's clearly obvious to uh, to anyone who cares to look at it. Apart from the fact that. Um, you know, like you said before, Roxy, most most people aren't clearly awake to what's going on. They're more interested in looking looking at their iPhones as they walk along, or, or watching X Factor or some TV show, or um, you know, stuck in the daily grind without uh, without sort of realising. Um, and that's that's where you know I looked around a little while back and thought, you know, people aren't awake, and we need to wake them up. Um, so we began a, a you know the process of of doing that through. Uh, peaceful, active uh, protesting, you know, um, and that then sort of paints a bit of a target on you at the same time in terms of those who are out there trying to hide this and uh, legitimise it before it uh, before it falls over and, and, and hits them in the face, uh, which it could quite clearly could do because, I mean, obviously there's massive corporations as well as government that are complicit in this and um, some of those would take a very, very hard fall uh, once the people wake up and realise that they've been complicit in in spraying us with um, with highly toxic chemicals, like you say, without our permission. Correct. Um, now, has anybody even remotely come close to um, getting, for instance, in Australia, um, anyone to even listen to the idea of a moratorium? 
just in the just an idea of at least having a moratorium until things are sorted out. No, uh, our government is clearly still in in the first phases of of that denial. Um, our members throughout the the nation have written uh, hundreds, if not thousands, of letters and emails to. Um, their elected representatives and uh, our federal government and, and transport ministers and um, the Environmental uh, P- Protection Agency, and we're met just with with you know a scoff of derision and, and flat denial, basically. That um, no, 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 it's just normal. You're just saying contrails. It's it's just uh, jet jet gases and and you know water vapor cooling into crystalline uh, matter in the air. Um, nothing to be worried about. So, no, definitely not. Um, the, the government is still in a very much a um, uh, a flat denial of, of the situation. And, and whether that's because a lot of people are actually still asleep in the government or whether, you know, I mean, there's obviously an out and out, uh, you know, agenda of denial. But we, we haven't made that as, a, as an inroad. Um, we continue to send those emails and those letters and, um, um, you know, we're sending them out to not just the government now but to, to other organisations that may be, wondering what's going on, um, you know, things like the Beekeepers Association, beekeepers in Australia now wondering why their bees are dying. So it's good to, you know, have a little chat to them and, and say, hey, look, you know, this is what we believe is happening and why your bees are dying. How about you guys write a letter to the government as well, you know, that that sort of thing, just trying to get more and more people to uh, participate. Shoot those, yeah, shoot yep. the flaming arrows and, and try and start a fire somewhere, you know. Uh, great idea, absolutely great mm. idea, um, and and I think that uh, I love your attitude uh, because what you're saying is, hey, even though we have written, you know, hundreds, thousands of letters, and not really, we have done the same, and my organization has done the same, not to receive one letter back, and this is repeat letters going to the same uh, governors, the same senators, the same Congress. Uh, even the same lawyers over it repeatedly, not even getting one, no one, none of us getting one letter back, not even acknowledging they re- they were in receipt of our letter. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, uh, you know, one would think, oh, gosh, maybe we should just give up on that part then and move to something else because that doesn't seem to be working. But I think uh, I like your attitude because what you're saying is we're not going to stop. You're just going to continue to generate those letters and send them and then uh, invite other uh, suffering organizations, others who have noticed, uh, like the bee uh, keepers, uh, and get them involved as well, and farmers and whoever else you can, for that matter, um, and get them. Now, what would you say to the argument, though, because I've definitely had these thoughts myself, that if the government is the absolute culprit, then why are we going to the culprit asking for change? Because, I mean, you know, it was once said the definition of insanity is is doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. Um, And that's kind of what we're doing in in a sense. But but we have to do that because at at the base level, the government is the one that's going to have to acknowledge this. And, you know, like I said, that the scientific community is producing masses of information on geoengineering, solar radiation management, stratospheric aerosol injection. Um, these guys are, are being paid by the government and they're producing this information. So we've got this ridiculous situation where, on the one hand, the government's denying that this is happening. We, we do get letters back of denial. I'm surprised you guys don't even get that. But And on the other hand, um, they've got their own, own bodies producing this evidence saying, yes, we are doing it. So if we stop the one side, we're not going to be able to call the other side into into um, an open-air discussion and, and, you know, get some clarity on the situation. So we, we're asking that we, – we're telling the government point blank, number one, we know you're lying and denying this. And number two, we want disclosure. You know, we're ordinary citizens. We're not, you know, some fringe Fruit Loop group. We're just ordinary people that woke up one day, looked up, realised something that's, is going on, has done some research. We've got soil, water, aluminium uh, tests. Um, we've got, you know, good anecdotal evidence. We've got empirical evidence. Um, and we want to present it to you and we want disclosure. And, and we're going to keep doing that until 
Uh, keep saying those things until you guys come clean about it. And they've got to come clean about it. They have to. They, they know they've painted themselves into a corner and we're not going to take the pressure off. And that's, that's why we keep going on uh, on sending these. And, and, you know, some of our guys send, you know, quite a few hundred of these, like you say, repeat things again um, every week. And, uh, you know, I'm sure our elected officials are sitting there squirming about this whole situation and, and wondering how they're going to get out of it um, without looking like... Um, you know, virtually the criminals that they are. So um, while the wall of silence continues to, to be put up, um, there's cracks in it, and uh, and it's only by persistence that we will uh, open one of those cracks and kick a hole through and, um, and, and get this thing going, you know. Correct. Uh, and being that it is a global um, uh, action, um, it has to be a global activism as well because, um, mm. you know, the more countries that band together, um, it, then, then it is pressure on the government. Or it, And, you know, I do think that you're correct. I think that there are a lot of, uh, a lot of people in government that actually probably don't answer our letters because they don't want to know. See, what they don't know, they don't have to look at, and then they can just stay in denial and let somebody else handle it. You know, they don't want to get their, um, you know, their shoes dirty, so to speak. So um, they'd rather just never reply at all to say that they, they won't deny, they won't confirm. They just stay completely out of it. I mean, and that's that's typical not just for government members but members of the public. I mean, sure. There's, there's some very, very bright people out there. Um, who do not want to know about this, um, you know, because they know if, if they acknowledge this or they look into it, um, something inside of them is telling them, you know, that's the edge of the rabbit hole, they're going to fall in and they're going to have to address it, you know. Their, <laughs> conscience, is, their conscience is going to say to them, you know, you, you turn your head on this one and, uh, and deny it and pretend that, that nothing's going on. And uh, you're going to you're going to have a very very seared conscience, you know. So they, they know if, if they don't address it up front, then they can just pretend it's not happening and they don't have to deal with it. Um, I know a lot of people like that, you know. And, and in their heart of hearts, they they know that uh, they're going to have to they're going to have to do something about it at the end of the day. And and that's you know that's where I worked out that um, if we're out in public waving banners around, if we're um, doing this in a peaceful manner and uh, just presenting ourselves as normal people um, that, you know, we're going to create a tipping point uh, or use that as a tool to create a tipping point quicker than uh, than writing a letter. You know, if we get some mainstream media coverage on this, uh, albeit, you know, positive and or negative, um, people are going to have that tipping point thrust upon them and they're thinking it's like, well, who are these guys and what are they doing and, and why are they doing this? Why, you know? And that's that's where we want to get people uh, to, Roxy, is at that point where they ask that question, why? And from there on in, um, you know, it's uh, it's all beer and Skittles, as we say down here. Right, correct. Uh, well, and, and environmentalists um, have always had problems and been painted as crazies throughout decades, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, we all know this. And, um, mm-hmm. you know, even the famous uh, Aaron Brockovich uh, I'm sure you know you've heard the name. Sure, um, sure. You know, uh, look at what she went through. Uh, the movie was just on the other night, and I took a l- look at a little bit of it. But I, I've seen the movie quite a few times, and and look at what the woman went through to get mm. to get justice. You know, mm. for so many people, and um, it's a perfect example of if you do not stop. I mean, her whole life was seemingly ruined at one point. Yeah. Um, you know, and, uh, you know, we've written Aaron quite a few times uh, mm-hmm. in That's regards to we. Right. And mm-hmm. I don't know what you're getting back, but we get a form letter that basically says, thanks for contacting us. And mm-hmm. we're not able to proceed with this. So it's unfortunate mm-hmm. because but she does still handle major cases. Um, what would you say the reason why she's rejecting this? Because I I would think by now that. Thousands of letters have come her way yeah, regarding chemtrails. Definitely, um, you know, I'm, I'm talking with people all over the world, and um, you know, a handful of us that I know of uh, <clears throat> have all sent letters off to Erin and um, got that pat reply back from her associate. She's there's something in the background that she's removed her some of her association with, um, you know, what she set up there in terms of foundation. She's still a spokesperson, but 
I think uh, someone in a team is sort of more handling that in the background. I'm not sure if we've even connected directly with Erin on this issue or or whether it's sort of been stopped from being given to her. But um, I was really a little bit disappointed because I thought, you know, if, if anyone would understand um, what it is that we're going through, it would be Erin herself, you know. I watched that movie a few years back and um, and she fought, a, you know, a long and protracted battle, um, a good fight, and ultimately, you know, a, a winning action in the end. Um, I, I don't know the reasons why why her lack of response. It would, it would be great if we could have her on side or, or someone like her on side, um, and I would certainly encourage anyone who you know, might be listening from her organisation to, uh, you know, to get in touch with us so that we can we can show you the evidence that we've got. I mean, you know, they say there's no evidence, but there is evidence um, of what's going on. And uh, it's it's pretty pretty plain. It's only you know you only got to put your A B C together, your ones, two, threes, and and you've got um, you've got something that you know you can present. So I'm not sure why Erin's you know not not on board with us, but hopefully um, you know we can shake that tree and keep shaking it and and get something to drop out of it. I think that um, one of the reasons could be because this is global and it's. Um, there are so many scientists and so many institutions for science that are involved in this and so many it, – it is so big mm-hmm. that uh, it, it's very possible that what you would be taking on would be all governments of the world. Hmm. Were you taking on the new world order at the end of the day? I think you're right. So, <laughs> you I know, think you're right. It's it's a big uh, it's a big bite of the cherry to take for for this anyone. Is a, this is an international uh, horrendous mm-hmm. scam at the mm-hmm. very least, yeah. and um, and I think that it's it's so it's um, what's the word it's so um, contrived and, and and it's so convoluted and it's so. Uh, so many boxes, you know, there's just so many different areas, arenas of this. The spider web goes way out there. Mm-hmm. And I think that the, it spiders off, I should say, mm-hmm. in, into so many segments that I think it's even hard to follow. It's insidious, definitely. Um, mm-hmm. You know, and that's that's a scary thought at the same time. But you know what? They're spraying us. They're poisoning us. They're they're trying to kill us. Ultimately, they they do have an agenda of global depopulation. If you if you go down the the New World Order Illuminati rabbit hole, um, that's p- pretty clear. I mean, you know, even um, Vice President Biden, I heard, came out the other day and about phase five of you know bringing the New World Order out. I mean, it's it's plain speak. Mm-hmm. Um, so if, if you are awake to that at the same time and you realise that, that that is an agenda, you know, global depopulation is an agenda, um, and you put those two and two together with what's happening with chemtrails and geoengineering, you quickly arrive at a point like I did, I guess, and I say, look, if I sit here and do nothing, I'm just going to get sprayed and die anyway. Um, so why not stand up and do something about it? Either die trying or, or you die not trying, one of the two. Um, my conscience won't permit me to not take these guys on, and you know I don't know what that's going to cost me at the end of the day. It may cost me a lot, um, but I'm not I'm not going to sit down and take this. I'm not going to you know stand by and and you know watch my children be sprayed to death by a, a handful of um, you know megalomaniacs who think they have a good idea. You know um, this is our planet. We, we're citizens, global citizens of this planet, and uh, and we have rights. And they they know that we are the majority. Um, and that, you know, if we were to actually all just wake up at the same time and go, no, um, <laughs> they would be in a very, very weak position, even with all their, you know, multi-billions of aeroplanes and tanks and guns and bombs and bullets, um, you know, a global rising, uh, uprising of, of the populace, not going to be easy to put down, you know. Um, unless you go to a, you know, an open warfare state. What which, I'd like you know, to know is how this thing got to be such a large, large scale operation. You know, seriously, like know. How, how did they, how did it get to be such a large scale operation? I mean, because you describe a very similar thing to, that happened with me. You know, one day looked up and and noticed these grids. And started asking, what the heck is that? You know, it starts off like that. But years ago, you know what I mean? And uh, like yourself. And it, it's like, um, so, you know, what, you know, I don't know when the transition was made. In other words, I don't know when they started spraying these t- 
to my knowledge is what I'm saying, not what we know today that it was in the 90s. I'm saying I just don't remember, you know, one year it was there all of a sudden. You know, it was just there. Um, and I don't recall seeing it in prior years anywhere that I lived or growing up. So um, what I'm saying is didn't they think we'd notice? And, and if we do notice, I mean, it's the easiest thing to point out, you know, but yet isn't it the toughest thing to convince people of? It is. It is. And um, somebody actually pointed this out to me the other day, and it was a little bit of a, a light going off. Um, they said, you know that the – the global agenda here for chemtrails and geoengineering is going to be a longer term program rather than a shorter term program by the way they are conditioning our children. And if you look in, in you know, kids cartoons these days, movies, you're going to see a massive amount of uh, chemtrails in the background of those things. Um, you know, NASA's rewritten all of the cloud charts and, uh, you know, kids, are, 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 you know, in geography at school are now brainwashed with, you know, all of these wonderful looking geoengineered clouds with new names and, and being taught that they're normal. There's a normalization process that's going on. So that's that's how we know it's going to be a longer term um, um, program and, and agenda that they're rolling out rather than a shorter term thing. So, um <clears throat> they, are, they are trying to brainwash us into accepting. And, and I was surprised, like yourself, um, it was really only two years ago that I, I sort of started looking into chemtrails geoengineering. Two years ago that I, I woke up to the fact and, and had that revelation. And um, we have something inside, it's called a reticular activating system. It's like you're going to go buy a new car and, um, and you know, you look around and there's a car in your mind you've got and then suddenly you see that car everywhere or you buy it and you see it everywhere. It's it's the same principle. It's, it's as soon as that, that thing is awoken to you and you, you have the revelation about chemtrails geoengineering, then, you know, suddenly it becomes prolific and you're going, how did I miss this? How could I have not seen this? And and that's what they're relying on is that we, we stay under that sort of level and we don't look up. I mean, it's it's patently obvious going back through the, the the information that you know mid 90s this is when it really kicked off but it can be traced back to to World War Two as a as a start when they were experimenting with smoke screens on the battlefield and and how to make those things so you know that's been progressively d developed through you know the 60s and 70s the Vietnam War is a, a real proving ground for spray technology and you know the whole Monsanto evil kicking off there as well um, and then you know, working out that, you know, you can modify the weather and, and you can use these chemicals and tools to do that um, through the 80s and 90s, developing that into a, a weather uh, warfare platform, um, you know, through the early 2000s to, to what we see today where we've got, you know, mobile harp stations that they just now uh, ship and, and tow to different countries and set them up offshore so they can fire directed energy weapons at people and uh, and not have a smoking gun, you know. Um it's it's all a matter, and this is what you know we referenced back to before. People don't want to know because they know if they if they look into it, then they're going to have to take personal responsibility. They're going to have to be accountable for um, you know their thought process and their actions from there. Um, and yeah, it means that they're probably going to have to do something um, to stop that. And you know a lot of people are scared about you know getting out in public and. And uh, thanks if you're just joining us. Uh, we're at the top of the second hour now, uh, and we've been speaking with the lovely Paul Mack from Australia, who is a chemtrails activist. He's got a lot more to fill us in on. And um, if you want to call the show this evening, we'll, we are happy to take your calls at any given time in this in this next hour. So the number is 347-688-2902. Again, that's 347-688. 2902 and if you forget that number and you're listening to the show on freedomslips.com the number is right there in front of your face <laughs> so um, you won't have a problem finding the number but again 347-688-2902 give us a call we're glad to take your calls if you have some questions for Paul um, I, I did get a few emails on uh, Tuesday's show that uh, I didn't repeat the phone number enough uh, for people to call in so there you have it and again freedomslips.com the number is right there on the front and uh, if you uh, didn't get to write the number down fast enough. Now, Paul, you know, we were just talking about um, uh, 
the idea is social conditioning, social engineering, uh, et cetera. And then there are those fe- there are those people who, as we both agreed, that uh, start to discover what's really going on, and then they can't really shut it off because once you uh, bite the apple so to speak it's in your mouth now and you 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 need to swallow the pill you know and um it, and that's what happened to me and that's what happened to you and that's what happened to a lot of people that i know it doesn't even matter the subject uh it could be gmos it could be the federal reserve it could be the world bank it could be the mortgage frauds um whatever it is once you discover it once you see just a little bit into that peephole uh you can't just make it go away um what we do need on on the planet is um, a wonderful thing that I think is occurring, whether it be chemtrails, geoengineering, uh, fluoride in the water, GMOs, you name it. One thing that is happening is that we as humanity do get to reach out to one another through all of these different windows and doors of activism and support one another. And I think that that is uh, most important. So, so those of you who are listening, you may not be interested so much in the subject matter of chemtrails but perhaps you're interested in the subject matter of gmos whatever the subject matter is remember this we're all in this to win it okay all of us no matter what it is because it's all connected everything is connected it comes down to one thing i think um disclosure and um, I don't know as much as that for me personally, Paul, that I'm going after disclosure. I want this stuff stopped, mm-hmm. period, yeah. uh, all of it, uh, definitely. Um, what about for you? Is disclosure on the list or are you kind of going after the same thing? You just want this stuff stopped. Yeah, obviously um, we, want it, we want it stopped. We want a permanent ban put in place, um, at the very least a moratorium. Um, so that we can we can go you know further into investigation, uh, and that's where disclosure comes in. If, if the government does disclose that yes they are performing these activities, then then we can call them to account straight away and say, well look stop, you know you've got very little of any oversight on this whatsoever. No environmental impact studies have been done. Nobody's taken the time to uh, do longer term studies in in, in terms of how this is affecting the human populace. Um, you know, you've got these crazy ideas that you, you want to modify and, and uh, manipulate and play with the weather um, to, you know, combat, um, you know, a CO2 crisis that you made of your own, your, your own making, you know. Um, stop it. Stop it. So we can, we can have a look at this and understand what it is that you're actually doing and, uh, and say, yeah, okay, well, it's a good thing or, no, it's not a good thing. It's a very bad thing. And stop, stop spraying us, and stop poisoning us, and stop poisoning our food and our children and and our water and and everything. I mean, this involves every single person on the face of the planet. It's it's the very air we breathe. It's it's not like you can localize this protest to to any given place. You know, people are unhappy about one thing, so they protest over there. This is this is the whole planet. You know, it's, it's, there's there's nothing else. If we don't have we don't have the air to breathe, there's there's nothing else that matters. At all, you know, it's all gonna gonna go away. So um, we try to bring people to that focus as well. It's obviously not the easiest thing in the world to get your head around rocks. Well, and you'd think that people would be able to digest it because "quote unquote" saving the planet isn't a new concept. You know, no. the actual words "saving the planet." It's it's not a new concept whatsoever. Um, uh, we have a question from the chat, Paul. Um, they said, "Do you think it's all the same stuff used, or do they change it up?" Um, from what we've been looking at in terms of, you know, we're networking with people globally now, and we're finding all sorts of different people around the world are reporting um, different makeups in the in the in the chemtrails in the aerosols. Um, there are a number of people uh, globally, possibly about 2% of the population, that can smell and taste um, stratospheric aerosols when they've, when they've been sprayed, you know, some 30 to 40 minutes afterwards, given, on the, alt- given the altitude that they're spraying at, um, these guys are reporting to us that, you know, they can taste you know, strong metallic tastes or, or um, you know, fungal things, or, or they can smell... Um, you know things like detergent, um, and and so it's it's apparent that there's different chemtrails uh, or different 
uh, types of chemtrails being sprayed and they have different reasons. We think we've identified around about um, seven or eight of those. Um, so some of those might be uh, biological material. There's certainly anecdotal evidence that um, human blood cells have been found uh, in, in chemtrail material. Um, you know, this is it's an emerging field because the, the, the chemtrail science seems to be changing. Um, as our awareness grows, as more and more people are waking up, it seems like they're actually camouflaging some of these trails to make them look like uh, smaller legitimate contrails and and you know I don't dispute contrails are real but um, you know the atmospheric conditions that um, that uh, need to be present for them um, it, you know it's quite rare that we should actually see them even with the increased amount of air traffic which is one of their you know standard little pat lines they like to bring mm. out um, you know so to just to answer that caller you know there, there is more material than aluminium, barium, strontium, sulfur dioxides, silver iodides, things like that, uh, that's being that's being found, and and certainly people are aware of that. Um, we would like more information in regards to that. Sure. Um, but yeah, it's it's not just those things, definitely. Well, and I think people have gotten interested in that, like um, because different clouds look different ways. The the bottom line is it's, you know, it's a I agree with you, a culmination of uh, different strategies and different weather modification, seed seed planting. I mean, to even have seed, you know, cloud bleaching, uh, mm. cloud seeding, um, make it rain somewhere, make it drought somewhere, uh, move a storm, make it bigger, make it littler. I mean, all of it is basically boils down to controlling the global weather, and mm. that's not cool. No, well, <laughs> that's can, all there is to you it. You can buy weather futures now, and people are speculating on yeah. the weather. So, I mean, those in the know are obviously going, well, yeah, you know, if we're going to geoengineer over here and we're going to create in the, in the backwash of that a lovely climate to grow things, well, I'm going to buy food stocks in that area and I'm making money out of this, Roxy. I mean, this is how insane it is. Right. Uh, <laughs> right. You know. Right. Uh, another question that's, uh, let's see, uh, um, from is this real life uh, user in the chat room they say yes i heard about the blood cells in the trails was it synthetic or real cells from what i can tell and, and, and what i've sort of looked around and researched um it's a combination of both um there is obviously a, a biological aspect to what they're doing with um with chem trailing and um you know uh, we're seeing people presenting now, and Clifford Carnicon's talked about Morgellons disease for for you know many years now. But um, when you when you meet people in your local community around you, you've got it, and uh, uh, you look at what it's doing to them, it's scary. So we know that there's nanoparticulate matter um, in both um, mechanicals and biologicals. And, you know, people with Morgellons are, are presenting that through skin lesions. We're seeing that coming out from their skin in, in terms of woolly, wiry-looking things or very sol solid metal-looking particles with, uh, with rainbow aspects to them and, um, and even geometric shapes uh, are occurring. So, you know, it's, it's definitely – they're trying to put a synthetic and a, a real – human aspect into this for what reason i don't know there's there's a lot of conjecture around that um how they're trying to maybe tune our bodies more in, in line with heart but or you know maybe even manipulating them for for other purposes that we're we're unaware of but you know that's that's a big field and it's a lot of it's unsubstantiated the fact is that they are doing it the fact is that we are seeing these things presented uh you know coming from human beings and um the fact is, we don't we don't know properly what that is and and, and why that is. You know, it's, it's another sort of thing we really would would like some more information on. Sure, uh, no doubt. Um, and in the big picture, because it is a big picture, mm -hmm. but in the big picture, the over plan here. Um, why, again, are they doing this? What what is the ultimate goal? Is it to kill off, you know, 80% of the population of the world? Is it for money to trade on the stock market? 
is it to cover up other toxicities that are going on, whether it be oil or nuclear, et cetera, or big commercial plants that have leaked for years and years, things like TCE poisoning that people are dying of now years mm. and years later. Is it – or is or – are, or, or are these programs in your, you know, mind <laughs> – are they all sort of centralizing on one thing, which would go back to depopulation? I mean, is this its motive? Mm. Um, <clears throat> there's a lot of ifs and is is there, and I don't know that I could answer all of those uh, specifically. Um, I, I get the sense, Roxy, that in the background there is – uh, a lot of experimentation going on. They are trying different things out on the populace uh, to see what kind of results they get. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of little offshoots to the rabbit hole. You could go down there, and um, and a lot of those are fringe. Um, while I look at them and follow them, I'm probably not the most qualified person to to answer those questions specifically. Uh, I have my own personal theories and conjectures about some of those things, um, but that's not really something I want to talk about today, you know, because that's all they are at the moment is they're, they're theories and conjecture. I don't have, um, you know, strong empirical or anecdotal evidence that I could I could present and be confident uh, about, you know, some of those topics. Sure, no problem. And uh, we do have a caller. Let's see which caller, 803 area code. So, caller, uh, are you are you here? I'm here, but I was just listening. I thought I was calling a mobile number to listen. Oh, you just want to listen to the show? That's it. But uh, I, No, I no, you can do that. Call. But while you're on the show, do you want to ask a, a question? Well, I just tuned in. It was, uh, I haven't have an idea of what the uh, question would be. Oh, Except gotcha. Well, why don't we just put you back on mute, and yeah. uh, or you could just go ahead and continue to listen to the show, okay? Thank you very much. You're very welcome. And, um, you know, with that in mind, too, uh, Paul, what you were saying is you're not, you know, you don't feel qualified um, to answer those questions. I, um, I understand why. I mean, we're talking social engineering, social conditioning. We're talking HARP. Yeah. We're talking, you know, smart meters and smart meter grids and worldwide grids that they're yeah. setting up that, um, you know, and um, then we've got solar. You know, we've got some solar issues going on as well. I mean, that's 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 un, that's undeniable at this point, you know, X flares and so forth. And then we've got the cycle of the, you know, it's the cycle of the Earth. We've got, you know, uh, we've got all kinds of stuff out in space that fly by every now and then. Mm. <laughs> you know what mm -hmm. I mean? And, sure. um, you know, and then we've got synthetic biology and we've got the, um, you know, the idea that it's very possible um, that, you know, we can be actually become robotic. And, you know, there are a lot of military men that have had sure. their arms and their legs replaced and are able to walk and move their, you know, with uh, uh, synthetic limbs and using the brain to have them operate and function and so forth. So, I mean, we've really – science is amazing. You know, mm. science has provided, uh, you know, so, I mean, look at how you and I are talking. You're in Australia. I'm in Arizona, USA, and we're doing a show and people from all over the world are listening to us right now. So, you know, technology, science, all of it, you know, it's got its good points, you know. And I've mm. always said to myself for everything that science has ever done, and I think you you might be someone who might agree with this, is that – on. Uh, there are side effects to some of these experiments. There oh, are yeah. si right? Mm, yeah, for sure, for sure. And it's these side effects aren't pretty. No, no, no. It's uh, yeah. I mean, you know, look, it's it's we've made some wonderful uh, advances in technology and mm. and uh, and leaps in science. But um, I mean, there's been a lot of horrible stuff in the background that's had to happen for those uh, for those leaps to occur. You know, if you look at what happened in World War Two and and Hitler's doctors and uh, and the medical leaps they made uh, at the cost of um, you know experimenting on the population, um, you know there's there's <laughs> there's a clear uh, link there you know so yes. um, 
we, we are being experimented on. And, um, you know, to, to what degree, I don't think uh, even the most polished of us fully comprehend and, and know yet. Um, I mean, there's there's little sort of pointers that, uh, that you know, if you want to follow them, take you to some pretty scary and dark places. But uh, we, I don't really want to go down that road today. I mean, it's, it's more about um, – I think if people wake up to the overall geoengineering chemtrail phenomenon first – then you know you can you can follow uh, that back to its its little home and uh, and see where the tentacles go from there. I mean, there's there's plenty to, to to talk about in that regard. But you know, my focus primarily is is awareness, raising awareness. And uh, even though I've got my own ideas in the background, and you know, <laughs> it's 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 about staying on track with what we're doing. I think it's very easy for people to wander off and. You know, you can spend a couple of years just looking at this before you even put your head back up again to see what's going on. Absolutely, um, and you know what? Um, when when you go to let's say work, you're you're in construction, correct? Mm-hmm. And yeah. um, do you talk to your fellow uh, construction workers about any of this? Um, I generally not. Um, you know, I'll talk to anybody who who shows an inkling or an understanding. Uh, but a lot of the guys I work with, I mean, you know, construction workers, it's all, you know, what happened to the football at the weekend and, you know, how many bars they went to or ladies they might have gotten together with or whatever. It's it's very base. I mean, you know, a lot of these guys not interested in having a conversation like that. So you got to pick the people you talk to. It's it's only smart that you do that. Um, but, I've, yeah, there's a few, few, few people that I'm, I'm working with that um, I've got a background conversation going with definitely do the do your co-workers know that that you're an activist no i think they'll be surprised when they see me on the six o'clock news one night it'll be a revelation to them really <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> oh that sounds like fun well mm. and see this is this is uh you know i'm asking because we also get people who are saying you know my family and my friends think i'm crazy and what do i do and i think it would be the same thing that we you know all uh, as the activist, you guide people to like-minded individuals, you yeah. know, so that you can have that open discussion and you're not um, tainted with anything and you're not a crazy person and you're not a crazy person. And as a matter of fact, um, there, as Paul has been saying all night, there is so much evidence to support the experiments are happening, not going to happen. They are mm-hmm. in the process right now. Um, there is uh, something I'm looking at right now. It's from the Department of Earth, Atmospheric and Planetary Sciences uh, in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And this is uh, Valerio Lucarini or Lucarini. And the abstract is the intrinsic difficulties in building realistic climate models and in providing complete, reliable, and meaningful observational data sets and the conceptual impossibility of testing theories against data imply that the usual Galilean scientific validation criteria do not apply to climate science. And it goes on and on and on and on. Yeah, it's it's great. It's a great piece. Yeah, yeah. And uh, anyway, it's a, it's, a, it's a white paper, you know. And it goes on and on and on. And, you know, obviously they're looking for some money, you know, as you had mentioned yeah. earlier. And yeah. the key words are climate change, complex systems, decision-making processes under uncertainty and model system yeah. biases and so forth. So, you know, a lot of money is spent on just the the ab- the, the, the uh, hypotheses of, of an idea, et cetera. Yeah. Um, that's not even being implemented. That's not even being studied. And um, and then it goes all the way up into the actual implementation. Who's in those planes that are spraying this stuff, Paul? Who is it? To my mind, uh, there are three separate groups that are, in terms of being in the air, that are involved here. Um, there's ob- the obvious ones in terms of military and uh, private contractors. But I also believe that commercial airlines are, are definitely involved. I mean, we've been collecting data on commercial airlines for months and months, in fact, 12 months now. Um, and I- every single piece of that points to uh, a massive involvement from uh, commercial airlines all over the world, you know. Uh, and these are all big name companies. They're, um, you know, well known, branded uh, tourist flying airlines that, um, that are up there every day. And we're seeing, you know, 
massive chemtrails coming out the back of them, uh, and we're living under those flight paths. So, you know, they're, they're the three the three culprits, um, and we'd certainly encourage uh, anyone who might be listening who's involved in that industry who knows what's going on in the background, but um, uh, you know maybe a little bit frightened to speak up to to come come to us. We'll offer you a, a safe environment or as safe as we possibly can, obviously, to, to do that uh, and uh, come and talk to us about it and, and share maybe some information. We're looking for, for whistleblowers from the airline industry, um, you know, uh, ev- everything from, you know, suppliers right up to uh, to, to pilots. So, um, and we're certainly, you know, we're a peaceful body. We're a peaceful group of people. We don't want any problems, any trouble. We don't want to create trouble for anyone. Uh, we're certainly a, a very non-violent in our approach. Uh, we just want answers. So uh, if anyone's listening that has those answers and, and they know that their conscience is going to be burnt at the end of the day if they don't provide them, uh, wanting to step forward, then, you know, um, email me. The, the, the email's up on uh, on Roxy's website. And we'll start a conversation in the background, and I'm more than happy to talk to you about it. That's great. And have you spoken with any pilots, speaking of pilots? Um, yeah, I have a, a couple. Uh, I've got a, There's a couple of pilots who want to speak to me, actually. But, <laughs> uh, but I know that they're, uh, they're coming from a different angle. Um, they're certainly wanting a, a debate on um, chemtrail, contrail uh, science and the con- you know, that, that specific mm-hmm. debate. I want to keep that that pigeonhole and working around in, in, in that that sort of um, zone rather than branching into the whole geoengineering side of things, uh, which they'll have to get on 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 that page sooner or later. So I wish they'd hurry up and do it sooner, so that uh, we can organise some of these uh, debates that they want to have. Um, I've certainly got some some very good speakers who'd be interested in talking to them at the end of the day, but uh, we're not going to do it on a on a contrail chemtrail. Um, uh, basis that's for sure um but yeah i mean other, other than that um i know a couple of civilian pilots and I've, and I've spoken to them um pilots are a special breed they um they love what they do and they love aviation i mean i'm an aviation enthusiast have been since i was a kid rocks you do anything to get around um, um warbirds and, and you know older planes especially I, it's always been a been a passion of mine uh, so I understand aviation, how it works. But pilots are a special breed. They they like to protect their own very, very much, and um, and that's understandable. So, again, they're, they're probably in the, the less receptive um, side of the community, and those that, that are in the know certainly are um, in the hush-hush side of it all. Oh, okay. So do you think that there are pilots who are completely unaware of this, though? Oh, totally, yeah. No, I, okay. I, I, they're in the I dark. with that statement. They are in the dark. Um it makes you wonder why if you're flying along and you're seeing all this stuff in the air specifically. But um, I think a lot of pilots uh, are <laughs> either ignorant or or if they do know what's going on, they've been fed the lie that, you know, this is for the planet's good and um, it's okay, it's not harming anyone. But we just, you know, we don't just don't want to create mass freaking out from people below. So, you know, come join with us. You're, you're you know, you're the good guys. You're doing the right thing. We'll protect you. We'll look after you sort of thing. So. Yeah, I'm very, I'm very curious about the whole pilot thing. We had a pilot that came to 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 us, um, and you know, gave the whole contrail science debate. Um, mm. And uh, of course, that's so tired for me. I I, I just can't I can't do it. Um, mm. But and you know why? But it's interesting because you know then he got on the bandwagon of, and we checked him out. And he's actually a real commercial pilot. Um, and um, Anyway, long story short, you know, he said, you know, he would be willing to try to, you know, get in the good fight for, you know, um, pollution, you know, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. because there is that aspect as well, you know, pollution. And he'd he'd be at least willing to do that. And at least he was giving that, you know, part of himself to it and willing willing to take that on. And we found out he's actually running for a, 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 a government seat as well. So oh, in wow. Congress, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. So you know, you it's 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 interesting because if he was for real, you know, and 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 his name is Stephen Knusel, and Stephen, if you're listening to this show like you do all the time, 
when you're not flying, call in the show right now at 347-688-2902. Seriously, he's, he's told me he's going to. And uh, welcome back uh, on a Friday evening. And I want to thank everybody who's taking the time to listen to the show tonight. <clears throat> because it is Friday, but you're not allowed to go anywhere until after this show. And that's all there is to it. Anyway, Paul, um, why, what I'd like to know, first of all, is um, how did your rally go in January this year? What happened? How did you get everybody together? Um, uh, you took to the streets. Tell us a little bit about it. Yeah, sure, Roxy. No problems. Um, look, just for some background information, a, a rally just doesn't pop out of thin air, and it, it takes a lot of networking with people over you know a reasonable amount of time, at least sort of nine to twelve months, in, in some cases, before you can get something that's um, that's going to be workable and, and usable. Um, I certainly didn't want to start something um, that was going to be just local. I wanted to see something more international. So 12 months ago, um, I looked around. I found a friend online who had started a group called Australian uh, Australians Against Chemtrails, uh, a guy called Matt MC. And um, Matt and I banded together and we, we strategized how we would go about raising awareness generally speaking and we thought well you know there's a couple of groups in the country on facebook but really nothing sort of significant was happening so we put a group in every city in the country major city and uh and have started feathering out into regional areas and then in those groups we started putting or building communities some of them have been more successful than others um, but that's just just a, a facet of how it's sort of been put together, and you know, we, we've over the last twelve months we've got traction with that. Um, we put in uh, people who were, were you know definitely in the know about what's going on or awake to to what's going on, and and located them to to the communities around them, sort of thing. So it, it became a grassroots um, point for for all of those people. And, uh, and then through that process um, of education, because a lot of people are still coming in, waking up at that point, uh, you know, we spend time educating in the groups and talking about what's going on in the background. Um, and, and these are just ordinary ordinary citizens like you and I, Roxy. They're just ordinary people uh, in society and in life, and they are wanting uh, something done about it. I mean, they're scared. They, they wake up and they're going, well, hang on, I'm being sprayed. Who's spraying me and why? Um and now they've got to a point where they're, they're angry about that and, and in a good way they want to do something about that. So that, that sort of all has to happen in the background first if you're, if you're thinking about um, getting something going in, in terms of a protest. Uh, you need to have a mindset that you're engaging people at a grassroots level in your community and, uh, and you're building upwards from there. That's you know the best place to come from. Um, so we got that to a point where... I said to them all, you know, mid to late last year, um, and we, we bound together with another another group, the actual the Australian and New Zealand Geoengineering Protest Group, um, and we kicked that off with uh, the January 20 protests. So we had maybe three, four months of planning leading up to that, um, advertising the event in, in all of our grassroots groups, Advertising it uh, in, in terms of an international scale, and we went through, you know, Russ Tanner at Global Skywatch, Sky Dane Wigington from Geoengineering Watch, the guys at Aircraft.org, anyone and everyone uh, who would listen to us um, in in terms of you know wanting to promote the show and, and promoting it for us by by advertising. A lot of people not on Facebook, so I mean, Facebook is a limited sort of uh, mechanism. Uh, in that regard, so we set up, you know, a parallel uh, email entity for associated with those adverts to, to, to capture that audience, and um, we've certainly had, um, uh, you know, a high level of interest from from people who are non Facebookers who want to engage the protest, uh, and we've now been able to just this last week actually let everyone know. Um, what the addresses are for for the upcoming April one, but in terms of January, yeah, there was a three to four month um, work up to that, and uh, and then we we launched it and um, uh, found people who are responsible in, in every major city. We're still looking for for some people in 
in some of the cities and uh, in regional areas to step up and, and some of those communities grow a little bit bigger. Um, but we got we got the nuts and bolts of it together for, for January 20th. Um, I hosted the Melbourne protest where we had uh, 60, 65 people uh, come out for our, our first event uh, and we had some 180 over 16 to 18 locations uh, in three, four different countries for the uh, for the overall January 20 protest, which is fairly, you know, it's modest, it's humble um, start. It certainly wasn't um, groundbreaking and in, in news making in, in any way, um, but I think a lot of people sat back and, and watched and wondered what was going to happen when when we when we launched this process, and uh, you know. They watched it and, and saw some of the footage afterwards and realised that, you know, hey, look, it's just people just like them sitting at home, um, ordinary people who got out on the day. We had, you know, mums and dads. We had teens. We had, uh, you know, three, four-year-olds. We had even babies and, and dogs on the protest with us. Um, you know, not your uh, your typical um, protest sort of set up, just ordinary concerned citizens. So um, I was really pleased with the overall result in, in terms of, um, uh, what we ha- what happened for January 20th? We had a few failures on the day. We've we've learnt from uh, and and restructured some things there. Um, it's certainly very much at the at the outset of what we're trying to achieve uh, in terms of an ongoing action, um, and it's in, in its formative stage right now. So um, April the 20th, I'm expecting maybe double the numbers, uh, and you know. I think um, people have formed relationships from the previous events uh, now have that nucleus and, um, you know, talk, talking to someone online is completely different to meeting them in person when you can look them in the eye and, you know, maybe give them a hug or shake their hand and uh, you can you get a, a better sense of trust in, in somebody and uh, who somebody is. So um, as, we, as we go along the road, we'll get more and more traction through personal uh, physical relationships, which is really where, where we should be. Um, and what we should be doing. Um, I encourage anyone who's listening, sitting behind their keyboard, who, who you know, complains about what's going on but hasn't got out to a protest yet for whatever reason, um, to come and engage the, the community in a protest because, number one, it gives you a whole different perspective about, um, you know, who's out there and what's going on. Uh, number two, it frees your mind from any fears you might have had that, uh, you know, men with black vans might be following us around or whatever. I mean, that's just rubbish. Um, and uh, number three, it energizes you um, to to move forward into the future. You know, it motivates you. Um, it, it releases something inside of you that says, "Yeah, I'm I'm actually doing something." You know, I'm making a noise. I'm on the street. Um, I'm not just sitting there behind my keyboard, bitching and moaning about it and complaining, or you know, saying, "What are we going to do?" I am doing something, um, and it's very very liberating. It's a it's a great feeling of freedom. So. Um, if you're thinking about getting along to the next protest or a protest, um, you know, shoot us an email and I'll certainly plug you in where uh, where I can um, and, and, you know, maybe put you on a mailing list into the future as we develop, uh, you know, the protest movement across the world. Sounds fabulous. I mean, I, I love it. And right now you did say you're in four uh, four countries? Yeah, we've… Is that um, yeah, four countries definitely. We've, we're networking with you guys in the US uh, through a couple of sites there, um, both Facebook and uh, and just normally online. Um, we've certainly worked in the background, like I said, with Russ Tanner and Dane Wigington, uh, all the guys from What in the World They're Spraying, Scott and Michael. We've talked to them. Um, we've talked to you know Morgan Carey and Skull, um, <clears throat> you know Skull, the Korean reggae artist who put out the song Sky Die. Yes. Uh, Cry Die. Sorry. Um, you know, we've had had dialogue and uh, conversation with those guys, and we've formed relationships with them. We're forming relationships through Europe and uh, and the UK right now with um, Chemtrails Project UK, London Geoengineering, um, and Truth is Support Group. Um, those guys over there, they're they're fantastic. You know, they're energised, they're awake, um, <clears throat> and we've got uh, our, our down under Australia and New Zealand connections. We're looking to to grow into. To every country, though, I'm, I'm talking to some of the guys in Europe right now. Um, we're just getting over a few language hurdles. Uh, but, you know, there are activists everywhere right now. We're, we're seeing protests, you know, in Switzerland, in Belgium, in Spain, 
uh, <clears throat> in the UK, right through the UK. Um, you know, the Urban Hippie just organised uh, the latest one with Mona Norman there on April the 6th at Hyde Park. Great turnout there. Um, um, Toxic uh, Skies Ireland did a, did a great uh, video uh, presentation right at the start and that I was very impressed with. Um, you know, Kelly Doherty from the, the, the Californian Bay Citizens um, Group had an action um, a couple of weeks back now where they went to San Francisco uh, City Hall when 35 people turned up on the day. They had a wonderful day and, uh, you know, even right at the end of their protest, they, um, they panned up from Kelly's face and there's a dirty great big cam trail flying right over her head. Oh, no way. <laughs> yeah, it was great. In terms of an advert, you couldn't have got it any, any better. Oh, yeah, that's but, so uh, apropos. That's wonderful. Send you the link. But, I mean. I, I would like to see that, yeah. We're, we're sure they actually even geoengineer some of our weather for, for good weather for the protest, so we can't see that because we're making some waves down here. But, um, you know, it's a lot of fun and uh, a lot of energy is released. And, and people all over the world, just ordinary people, you know, these, these are not, you know, seasoned activists or protesters or militant uh, left or right wing whatevers. Um, you know, these are just ordinary citizens who are really concerned um, because they have, you know, family and children and uh, and they're worried and they want to know what's going on and the government's denying everything and, and we're sick and tired of that denial. So we're just going to keep, you know, keep going till we get some exposure and some traction and, um, you know, keep being up in their face with it all and and doing that in a peaceful manner. I've got to stress, Roxy, there's people, especially shills and trolls right now, they're trying to paint us as, as some kind of, wacko activists who have secret, you know, surface to air missile supplies and want to shoot down planes or or laser Oh, I pilot. know. Terrible, sort of, isn't it? It's it's insane. I mean, just the the lengths that these people are going to to try and paint us as as fringe is uh is quite significant and telling of itself. I mean, we are not that people, you know. We're we are just peaceful, ordinary concerned citizens. We're not uh, any anything that's out there in that that sort of vein whatsoever and um, <clears throat> anyone who engages those shills and trolls on that level, please stop it. Please don't feed them. Starve them to death. They like you to, to come and, and play on their pages and walls. Um, they like that because it distracts you from your real focus, which is, you know, creating awareness in the community and, uh, and letting people who care know and who need to know know. If you're wasting all your time fighting with shol- uh, trolls and shills, I'd just say to you, stop it, you know. Stop feeding them. Leave them alone. They hate that the most when you leave them alone, and uh, and you know re- refocus yourself, reorient yourself, get out there and and do something that's positive and it's going to make a difference. Talking to those guys won't make a difference; it'll just send you batty. That is really, really good advice, Paul, because mm. you're absolutely right. I am seeing this everywhere right now. They are; mm. it's almost like the full court press or something, because they're they're. They're getting anybody any time for anything with chemtrails, and mm-hmm. um, and then they've started what a bunch of group pages on Facebook and and uh, you know chemtrail activists are going to those group pages and you know, I've said the same thing like don't go there don't even go to there just stop participating in the conversations because you're absolutely right Paul it's a complete distract distraction and if you stop talking to them it's not working. Mm. I mean, most of those groups. I mean. One of the biggest ones I've seen has a hundred hundred people in it. You know that might be the biggest troll group. Most right. of them are like twenty, forty, thirty, sixty, mm-hmm. something like that. You know, um, so it's only a very very small minority, and and they do create a lot of waves, and they feed on your angst. And um, mm-hmm. you know, I don't even want to give them this airtime, but you know, at, yeah, at the I same got time, I, w- I just want to point out to people, you know, if you feed them, they'll starve. If you stop having the conversation with them. Um, they may not leave you alone with what they do, but it won't affect you. You know, get, do something positive. Just, just don't do that. You know, right? Well, what you're talking about is much pro, more more proactive, and like you said, there's an energetic to it as well. Component, you know, an energetic component makes you feel good. Mm. It does definitely. Um, um, it's it's a liberating feeling. I've said this on a couple of shows now. Different hosts that I've talked to that. Um, when you get out there for the first time, and uh, and you're you're in the throng of that, and, and and the hub of it, and 
um, people are, you know, handing out information and, and talking to people on the street and, um, you know, there's, there's an energy that's released that's it's just truly exciting. Uh, it's a real buzz and, uh, and you come away from that just, um, just feeling so much more, um, uh, you know, positive about how you view the world and, and how you view um, your place in it. Uh, and, and having done that, you, you, I don't know what it is you release. It must be something, something inside your brain that you release um, that just says, yeah, you know, I'm not going to take this lying down. I do have a conscience. I do have a right to, uh, to speak and, and, and share truth and knowledge. Um, and I've exercised that and, uh, and, and I feel good about it. You know, I feel liberated about that. And, and I'm going to do that again and again um, until I waken up people up that they understand what's going on and uh, until we're a voice that's, you know, can't be denied or shouted down or, or ignored um, and, and until my government tells me what's going on because right now, government, you're lying to us. We know you're lying to us and we want you to stop. We want disclosure. So, you know, it just empowers you to, to, to keep going for that as a goal and, you know, just sitting behind your keyboard is, is not enough. Putting... Uh, your boots out on the street is is the next step uh, to my mind. You know, be a keyboard activist at the same time, and there's plenty you can do in terms of emails and uh, background setup. I mean, there's all sorts of administ administrative stuff uh, as well that needs to take place and and that supports what we're doing. So, um, you know, it's very important things. I'm not not saying that uh, you know anyone on a keyboard's not doing something important, but certainly getting out in public is uh, is a great thing to do. Surely. Um, and and uh, by the way, we had another question from the chat room. Um, you and I were on the, the pilots and uh, Cher had asked, um, are many pilots uh, coming from the military? Um, yeah, I did, did see that question before and I was thinking at the time, Roxy, um, um, the military don't pay their pilots all that well. Mm -hmm. So if you go into commercial aviation, you will find a lot of ex-military pilots. They've done their time in the military. They've got their flying hours up. Um, you know, they've possibly enjoyed what they've done in there. Um, but the money is not that great. So they've gone to uh, the commercial airlines where the bigger bucks are. So, yeah, definitely um, a lot of commercial uh, and, you know, uh, ex-military pilots uh, in the commercial arena and, and civil aviation arena as well. Um, there's certainly, gee, I don't know what the percentage of that would be, um, mm. maybe 60 70%, something like that. You know, I, I don't think a lot of people go in commercially, certainly, uh, and through the front door. I think a lot of them are ex-military, yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, wow, that's... That would actually make sense. And speaking of commercial uh, planes that are having chemtrails come out of them, you know, it's interesting that you just mentioned that it is commercial as well as military. Um, yesterday, I, I got some photos of um, a 747, and it was it sprayed from horizon to horizon. Mm -hmm. And it was the 747. And I just thought, oh, my God. And, and by the way, it was interesting because it was flying in the military uh, flight uh airspace it wasn't flying in the commercial space yeah yeah well like i said you know three people three types of, of industries are involved and that's uh, military private contractors and uh and the, and the commercial guys so um another thing we've been doing over the last 12 months is and we could probably do this a little bit better than than most places in the world because of the volume of air traffic that we've got is um, is mapping and and uh, following some of the flight radar programs um, <clears throat> with uh, what's going on with with Kim Trails, obviously. Um, so w we build a network across the country of grassroots community groups. Inside that network, there are further groups who are uh, sky watchers. We call them. They get out with time and date stamp cameras. They'll take a photo of, of a plane flying over, laying an obvious trail. We'll then flight track that on the radar. We'll take a photo screenshot of that. We'll couple that with the um, the time and uh, sorry the flight radar um, screenshot, and um, and that gives us a very powerful tool. We've been collecting all of that information all this time, and inside of all of that, um, you know, we're definitely uh, definitely very concerned and can confirm that you know commercial aircraft are involved. So. 
Um, just another thing for you guys to be engaged with, though, you know, like getting out and taking photos is, especially with a time and date stamp on them, is is a great way to um, to maybe let some of that energy off from just sitting behind your keyboard and feeling you can't do something. Um, being part of a program like that just allows you to, you know, share in terms of uh, documented evidence for everyone mm -hmm. to enjoy down the track. So um, there are things that you can do. Uh, every day to to engage this and, and and make positive inroads and and um, you know be a productive contributing uh, member to to bringing about government disclosure. Um, so don't feel that you just you know there's not not anything that you can do. I just encourage anyone who's thinking about getting involved get involved. Simple as that. Just jump in, start talking to some of the leaders and the admin, and um, you know find out what you can do to contribute and uh, and take a lead from the, those guys. Oh, yeah, I think that there's always a spot for people. And, Paul, thank you so much for the work that you're doing and for being inspired to actually make some changes um, for the planet. And, um, you know, thank you for, you know, having your wake-up call and saying, you know, hey, I've got to do something about this, you know. So um, I, I've only heard good things about you from others uh, in other countries even, and um, they just love you. So you are obviously making a big uh uh, change uh, and your name is really getting out there and uh, we're in support of what you're doing and of course we'll do you know we'll have an article with all the dates coming up that you're going to be doing your quarterly protests and so forth and um, and stay on track with that with you as best we can so you know thank you so much for your contribution it's huge oh, thanks Roxy and uh, thanks for having us on the show it's it's only by um, you know getting on shows like yours and, and sharing uh, nationally, internationally with uh, with people all around the world um, that we can get this exposure and get this message out and you know um, help help to wake people up. I mean, I'm I'm not the be all and end all of this. In fact, if I had a choice, I probably wouldn't be doing this at all, Roxy. But like I said, you know, I looked around two years, twelve months ago, nobody was really making some inroads in, in terms of activism and, and protest. There's small stuff going on, but um, there's a need out there for uh, for some global coordination and, and communication, and um, I just put a little bit of that ball rolling and, and engaged a, a few people out there. So, um, you know, one person can make a difference, and um, we're certainly going to try and grow the global um, situation into, you know, a movement that's uh, alive and vital and, um, we've got that well underway. They can't really stop us in that process now. So, you know, like I said, you guys out there, if you're listening, if you're thinking about getting involved, getting out from behind your keyboards, I encourage you. In fact, I implore you. We need you on the street. Um, please come join us. Absolutely. Well, great. And uh, um, I just want to thank uh, Green Girl who uh, posted in the chat. She thanks you very much for the show, Paul. She said, lovely guest. Um, and I think there was another gal, De De Debbie, and she had invited all her Aussie friends, she says, and, and they said that they thought you gave some excellent advice tonight. So um, thank you so much for the work again. And uh, hey, if everybody uh, out there wants to stick around, up next is a Reality Check with Nighthawk. And as you well know, Nighthawk is the owner of Revolution Radio. It is how we even have this opportunity to have this open discussion of the truth every day and every night on Revolution Radio. So uh, you need to stay tuned and give him a thumbs up as well uh, for all the hard work that he does. Again, thank you, Paul, for uh, joining the show. Everyone have a lovely weekend, and we'll see you on Tuesday. Revolution Radio proudly presents live from Phoenix, Arizona, the Truth Deny Talk Radio with host Roxy Lopez. Join us here for topics you won't hear about on mainstream news, such as chemtrails, GMOs, nutrition, and conspiracy facts regarding your personal sovereignty. Humanity is 7 billion strong. We are the majority. And now, live from the Valley of the Sun, your host, Roxy Lopez. 
and a very good evening to everybody. Uh, this is our first debut for Friday nights. Uh, we've added Friday nights to the list of shows that we do. Uh, so thanks for joining us here. And um, I have a you know very interesting uh, guest on this evening from Australia, and I'm going to bring him on shortly. Um, of course, uh, many of you know from the event pages on Facebook that we now do for the shows um, who our guest is and what the, the topic is, of course, is uh, uh, chemtrails and chemtrail activism. Um, I, I'm, I'm looking at a an article that's really disturbing to me right now. It's called uh, uh, "Get Used to Bre- uh, Record Breaking Heat Bureau." Uh, it is uh, come out of the Age of Environment tabloid. Uh, that's where the story hailed from in January, I believe. And we're going to have a few articles this weekend that are going to be coming up on the Truth Denied website as well. Just go to the breaking news pages. And, of course, um, we'll be interlinked with uh, Paul Mack, who is my guest this evening. And if anyone wants to take a look at any of his uh, website and his work, um, it's all linked on the truthdenied.com. And, of course, it'll be in the chat room. I want to thank... Uh, a mad painter uh, for producing my shows on Fridays now. I appreciate it. And, of course, if you want to listen to uh, a mad painter's shows, it's called Open Canvas, and they're on Monday nights here on Revolution Radio at 10 p.m. Eastern. Again, that's Open Canvas, Mondays at 10 p.m., and he's got some extraordinary controversial shows as well. So you might want to take a listen to him as well. Uh, the the uh, article that I'm looking at that um, I find disturbing, let me read a few of the highlights of it for you all. Um, there's a photo of a beach in Australia with a lot of people on the beach, and it says, Life's a beach. As the warming trend increases, Over coming years, record-breaking heat will become more and more common, scientists say. Temperatures off the charts as Australia turns deep purple and U.S. US posts year of record high temperatures as well. The heat wave has that has scorched the nation since Christmas is a taste of things to come, with this week's records set to tumble again and again in the coming years, climate scientists are saying. Uh, Quote, those of us who spend our days trawling and contributing to the scientific literature on climate change are becoming increasingly gloomy about the future of human civilization. That's a strong statement. The hottest average maximum temperature ever recorded across Australia, 40.33 degrees, uh, that's uh, not Fahrenheit, I believe, set on Monday, again, this was written in January of 2013, may only stand for 24 hours and be eclipsed when all of Tuesday's readings come in. Previously, that record had stood since December 21st of 1972. The current heat wave, in terms of its durations, Its intensity and its extent is now unprecedented in records, said the Bureau of Meteorology's Manager of Climate Monitoring and Prediction, David Jones. He said clearly the climate system is responding to the background warming trend. Everything that happens in the climate system now is taking place on a planet, which is a degree hotter than it used to be. Now, a degree may halt geoengineering and stratospheric aerosol spraying aka chemtrails that the planet and life as we know it is in great danger from an extinction level event the madness of a handful of evil men and women must be stopped and it is up to you and i to call these people to account in partnership with some fellow australians and new zealanders They have worked hard over the last 12 months to bring together a national, international network of like-minded people who are documenting and collating the the growing body of evidence in regards to chemtrails as well as forming a growing international protest movement to bring awareness to the public arena. The Australian and New Zealand geoengineering protests had their first mass rally in January 2013, where over 180 people from four nations took to the streets to protest geoengineering and demand government disclosure. 
We now run a quarterly, I'm sorry, he now runs a quarterly protest, the next dates being April 20th and July 20th, which we will get into tonight. We have uh, the links for the Facebook page and the email uh, available for you all on thetruthdenied.com. It's all linked up right there on the front page. We want you to link up, like their pages, join them in this movement. I know it's hard to believe that people are, the majority of humans do not even know, are not even aware of geoengineering programs, this thing we call climate change, the money behind it, the billionaires that are funding it, completely unaware. So I'd like to welcome my guest, Mr. Paul Mack. And I thank you, Paul, for the work that you're doing to bring awareness to the world. Welcome to the show, and how are you doing? Hey, Roxy. <clears throat> thank you for having me on the show. It's uh, it's good to be here. I'm doing, doing well this morning, a uh, little after 10 o'clock in the morning down in, uh, in Melbourne, Australia. Not sound like a lot to all of you, but it is. As the warming trend increases over coming years, record rate breaking heat will become more and more common, Dr. Jones said. We know that global climate doesn't respond monotonically. It does go up and down with natural variation. That's why some years are hotter than others because of a range of factors. But we're getting many more hot records than we're getting cold records. That's not an issue that is explained away by natural variation. Australia's climate is based on an interplay of many factors, including regional and local weather patterns. El Nino and La Nina climate cycles and the Indian Ocean dip hole, all superimposed on the greenhouse gas driven warming trend. While temperatures vary on a local and regional scale, globally it has now been 27 years since the world experienced a month that was colder than average. The impacts of the rising heat on farming, food, water, and human health have been studied closely for years, and the trends being played out now mirror those laid out years ago in projections by the Bureau of Meteorology, the CICERO, and the Garnet Climate Change Review. Now, if there is one thing that I will interject here, we are seeing a lot of... uh, controversy when it comes to the weather, extreme weather, uh, temperatures that are too low, temperatures that are too high, mostly temperatures that are going up and down sporadically, which I term is as unstable weather. The global climate is unstable. And what does that mean to all of us humans or anybody that's living on the planet? Instability has to be pointing at something. Now, I don't follow the global warming hoax that is linked to cap and trade and all the rest of it and quite a few of the laws that have aggravated me in regards to climate change. Uh, By the way, climate change is now the new terminology for global warming. Um, This is a major concern. And then you enter into this field, uh, radiation management, let's say, all the geoengineering. And, of course, those grids in the sky that we refer to so fondly of as chemtrails. What are chemtrails? Has anybody tested chemtrails? What are the effects of chemtrails? What are the effects of geoengineering on the planet? And who gave them permission That's what I want to know. I'm sure that's what people like my guest who will be coming on the show shortly wants to know. I want to know who is in charge and who gave them permission because we, the people of all of these countries, all the countries of the world, we are supposed to be in charge. We are the governing agents of our countries. We weren't given the memo. This is an extraordinary subject, one that I've been investigating for nearly four years, Uh, and the rabbit hole is deep. That's all I can say. The rabbit hole is absolutely astounding, and those who've been hired as disinformationists and so forth by the governments of the world to be in the center of activism groups and cause disharmony and slow down momentum with infighting, etc., it is. It's such a huge topic. Tonight's topic is chemtrail activism growing, the protest movements, 
networking internationally and, of course, the April 20th protest. A 46-year-old New Zealander living in Melbourne, Australia. My guest, Mr. Paul Mack, has a background in construction and currently works as a project manager for a large construction company. He says he was awakened in 2001 to the global situation regarding Agenda 21 and the New World Order. And he's spent uh, the last few years seeing just how deep the rabbit hole goes. Twelve months ago, he became increasingly concerned about growing geoengineering trends and the lack of activism taking place to bring accountability to the situation. He strongly believes that unless action is taken now to bring a ban moratorium into place to 